Good and welcome to all of you on behalf of the International Road Federation. We are very pleased uh, to host uh, this webinar um, of the United Nations Road Safety Collaboration together with the Prince Michael International Road Safety Awards and uh, Road Safe. Uh, this webinar is about road safety management, innovation and delivery in, de in developing uh, countries. It's a 90 minutes uh, session. Uh, please be aware that we are recording this session and we'll make the recordings and the presentations uh, that you will uh, uh, see today available for everyone after, um, after the, the session, so in the next couple of days. And no need to write to us, you will be receiving a notification when the proceedings of this webinar are uh, ready. My name is Susanna Zamataro. I'm the Director General of the International Road Federation. It's a, my great pleasure to welcome you all uh, here today. Um, without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor immediately um, to Etienne Krug, uh, who is the uh, Director of um, Department of Social Determinants of Health at the World Health Organization. Uh, Etienne, you have the floor for your welcoming uh, remarks on behalf of the UNRSC. Thank you. Etienne, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Susanna, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. I'm really delighted we are having another of the UN Road Safety Collaboration webinars. Thanks so much to colleagues who organized this because these are important and exciting times for road safety. We are embarking on a new decade of action. It just started 10 years of action to achieve a 50% reduction in road deaths and injuries. It's a tall order, it's ambitious, it is possible. We have quite a bit of experience accumulated in the first ever decade of action in the last 10 years. We can build on that. We can use what we know works and we know a lot already in terms of legislation, uh, enforcement, infrastructure and vehicles improvements, trauma care, uh, the whole road safety management. So, so there is a lot we know and we have been using already in the past years, but it's time for innovation. We need to use what we know transform it, improve it, come up with new ideas. And that's what, that's what this webinar is gonna be all about. Uh, in two words, the UN Road Safety Collaboration is an informal network of agencies, in a way driving the international road safety agenda. Many of the key players in the UNRSC, as we call it, have been behind the calling for the decade and are now working together on developing the plan for the decade of action. So I was delighted that in the context of the UNRSC and its webinars, our colleagues in IRF, uh, uh, in the World Bank, and the Prince Michael International Road Safety Awards and Road Safe came together to suggest us to have this uh, webinar. So thanks, Susanna. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks to all of you for uh, scheduling and organizing this event, where we're going to have really three different uh, but related sessions. The first one will be on innovation uh, in project delivery. The second one, innovation in uh, country delivery. And the third one, innovation in uh, resources. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to my friend Adrian Walsh, who heads the Prince Michael International Road Safety Awards for leading us into the first session. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Etienne, um, and uh, welcome to everybody from across the world. I will introduce the Prince in a moment or two, but first I'd just like to highlight a couple of things. The first is that these awards have been going for some 30 years, and they were created by the Prince himself, quite specifically to recognise achievement and innovation. Etienne mentioned innovation, and one of the most important things about innovation is one of the cat uh, criteria that is used in judging awards, and that is that they can be replicated elsewhere. Our focus today is on that replication, on innovative projects in the area of road safety management, which others can copy, follow, use, and develop. Please may I now introduce the Prince himself, who'd like to join us to welcome you, and also to highlight the successes 
of some of his winners for this year. Over the years, many of my award winners have been the inspiration behind some of the most successful innovations which have reduced road risk and saved lives. They've set high standards of good practice at every level from local to international. The awards recognize achievement and innovation but their fundamental purpose is to demonstrate to interested professionals how those particular initiatives have worked. Sharing knowledge and replicating good practice has always been essential, but this is now even more important during the second decade of action, especially if we're to achieve the ambitious goal of halving the number of road deaths worldwide by 2030. If we're going to achieve that, we need not just commitment from governments, but a significant increase in capacity to deliver programs on the ground and improve the way we share our professional knowledge. That's why I've initiated this series of webinars during which we'll be able to highlight the successes achieved by my award winners and give them the chance to make their ideas and experiences more widely known. We look forward to seeing that happen. Adrian, back to you. You want to introduce your speakers or would you like us to? Now, three case studies, which um, I think we ought to just show so that everybody can pick up the stories and listen to uh, what's been achieved from those people who achieved great success and innovation in the last year or two. I think we should just run straight into them and then play those videos one after the other because they're all excellent stories. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian, and please bear with us. We, we just realize the quality is better when we play them individually. Good day. I'm Sophia San Luis, Executive Director of Imagine Law, and I'm here to talk about Imagine Law's Slow Down to Save Lives campaign. Imagine Law is a public interest law organization that develops and advocates for public health policies. In 2018, 12,487 people died in Philippine roads. That's about 34 persons every day, or at least one person every hour. Since 2006, the number of road deaths in the country has almost doubled, and we have seen a rapid increase in road deaths in the last five years. It is believed that speeding contributes greatly to these numbers as it ranks third among the known causes of road crashes in the country, according to the Philippine National Police. Now, this is surprising considering that the Philippines has had a speed limit law in place since the 1960s. And yet, when you travel on Philippine roads, you'll hardly see any speed limit signs, much less speed enforcement. This is why in 2016, Imagine Law launched the Slow Down to Save Lives campaign. This campaign was envisioned as a long-term campaign that will help scale up implementation of the speed limit provisions of the Land Transportation and Traffic Code. But first, we had to set out to figure out why there was virtually no speed enforcement happening in the country. Through our research, we found out that the speed limit provisions of the Land Transportation and Traffic Code were not immediately enforceable. Under Section 38, local government units, or LGUs, would have to first classify their roads to determine the appropriate speed limits. By interviewing hundreds of LGUs, we found out that many of these LGUs were not aware of their mandate. We also found that the LGUs with speed limit ordinances did not have the equipment nor the technical capacity to conduct speed enforcement. 
Knowing these problems, we started to advocate for a national policy to address the gaps that we identified that were preventing wide-scale speed enforcement. This national policy was issued in January 2018 by the Department of Transportation, Department of Interior and Local Government, and Department of Public Works and Highways. Joint Memorandum Circular 2018-01 addresses the gaps that we identified by reminding LGUs of their mandate to classify roads and set the appropriate speed limits, providing LGUs with guidelines on how to go about speed limit setting and enforcement, providing a model speed limit ordinance that LGUs can easily adopt, and mandating the Land Transportation Office to conduct trainings for LGUs on speed limit setting and enforcement. Of course, we knew from the start that in order to increase the level of speed enforcement in the country, a national policy was just the start. We knew that we also needed to assist local government units as they enact their speed limit ordinances. This is why in 2018, following the issuance of JMC, we developed a toolkit to guide LGUs on how to enact speed limit ordinances. We also conducted regional trainings where we train LGUs on basic principles of road safety and walk them through the process of completing their speed limit ordinance. We also provided LGUs with direct technical assistance by assisting them with drafting and providing resource persons for committee hearings. Since then, 19 LGUs have enacted speed limit ordinances and four comprehensive road safety ordinances, with still many underway. Finally, to build the capacity of government to enforce speed limits, imagine law with support from the Global Road Safety Partnership, the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, under the United Nations Road Safety Fund, organize a series of speed enforcement trainings to prepare LTU, LTO and LGUs for speed enforcement. In these trainings, enforcers were trained by policing experts on the basic principles of speed enforcement and vehicle recognition, even apprehension techniques. Trainees were also given first-hand experience in using speed guns through practical training exercises. Policing experts also observed how information was cascaded by the trainees in the regional trainings on speed enforcement. They also facilitated a speed enforcement planning workshop to equip high-level officials of the Land Transportation Office on proper speed enforcement planning. As you can see, the road towards a country with zero road deaths is never straight and narrow. It has taken four years to prepare the country for speed enforcement, and the end is not yet in sight. Still, with the progress that has been made in just four years and the renewed focus of government on road safety, we are confident that we will get there. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, presentation is, uh, focuses on the importance of sharing knowledge and the value of observatories of which many are being formed in the world, and this focuses on two. Hi everyone, the uh, Prince Michael award-winning project Veronica and I are presenting is the, the development of the road safety observatories for Africa and the Asia Pacific. So I'm going to talk very briefly about how we started with um, what it really takes to do these things, funding, great partnerships, some gratitude to achieve success. Uh, GRSF developed proposals for these observatories for funding. The UK Aid Programme agreed to fund them, and that was really our, our start into funding. And subsequently, both Total Foundation and Pure Aid Partnership had added money for further data work related to them. And some of the other partner organisations listed below have also provided substantial funding to this process. And so these Prince Michael Awards really belong to the many collaborating organisations who have achieved the development of both of these extraordinary regional observatories. And they're all listed here for everyone to see. So I, I want to thank Prince Michael for his many years of support for road safety through these really special and wonderfully recognised awards. I want to thank all of the partners who've been key to this, 
And I especially want to thank the skilled team of experts we have within the World Bank who've led this work along with many from other partner organisations, but especially Veronica Raffo, Kara adel Hashan, Elena Berkeley and Elena Longo, as well as many others. And I'll hand over to Veronica to continue. Thank you, Soms. Let me share with you a little bit of, on what are the objectives of, of, of this initiative to develop regional road safety observatories. The first message is that we have this very wide gap between country official statistics and estimates from the WHO, uh, which are published in the Global Status Report. And this is mainly due to the quality of data available and the capacity, the technical capacity, in, in especially in low and middle income countries. So this initiative aims at accelerating country level improvements in data collection and uh, analysis and decision making, stimulating harmonization between countries in the definition of variables and data collection methods and procedures, fostering a positive competition between countries to improve their crash data systems and offering a common space for data and information sharing, for countries to share the lessons they've been learning on how they manage road safety data and road safety policies more broadly, and bringing all key stakeholders around the table on the basis of, of the principle of shared responsibility. One of the first outcomes that we expect from, from this work is to raise the, the visibility of the road safety of road safety on, on the political agenda of, of member countries. We want to create incentives for better road safety performance, emulation, cooperation, and help scale up improvements in, in, in the countries that are participating in, in, these, in these spaces, in these platforms, sort of with a snowfall, a snowball effect. Uh, given the initial work on, on improving road safety data management in Latin America, and, and the, the first outcomes that we saw were coming out of this initiative, uh, the World Bank and the FIA and the International Transport Forum signed a memorandum of understanding uh, to scale up these efforts and, and move on to, to new regions. The first one that uh, this team uh, of, of international partners with member countries uh, started working on was, was the, the re regional observatory in Africa, trying to replicate the experience in Latin America. You can see in this map all the, the ongoing efforts at the regional level. You see uh, the, the effort in Latin America, which is the OISEVI uh, observatory. You can also see in green the, the African Road Safety Observatory, uh, which is being developed under the auspices of the African Union. This initiative was launched in early 2018 and is, is now uh, working under the coordination of a steering committee led by uh, a very active uh, uh, member countries from, from Africa with the first General Assembly held in June 2019 with 35 African countries participating. Uh, you can see in blue in light blue, the effort and the development in, in Asia Pacific. But let me first uh, share with you uh, the work program that is under currently under implementation in Africa with funding support from the FIA Foundation, from Total Foundation and from UK Aid, in close collaboration with the African Union, with the UNECA and uh, all this funding uh, channel through the Global Road Safety Facility. The, the work program for us so is focusing on six priority areas, developing a network of road safety leaders in Africa, including data and policy professionals, improving tools and methodologies for vital registration systems, road crash and other safety data. And here there's been very close uh, work in, collab in close collaboration with WHO, which is in fact a new partner uh, that is coming into this memorandum of understanding to support the development of regional observatories. Another uh, priority area for work is uh, conducting research on costs and impacts, 
of road crashes in, in African countries and publishing and, and disseminating road safety reports with the first annual uh, RSO uh, report coming, coming up in the, in, in the coming months. We've done uh, a lot of work already under the Asia Pacific uh, work program from uh, training workshops in the area of road safety engineering, road safety management leadership course, to the, uh, the, the preparation of the first report on, on road safety indicators for the Asia Pacific Observatory, uh, the first annual report for the Asia Pacific Road Safety Observatory, which uh, is planned for delivery in the fourth quarter of, of this year, and the website, which you can see on, on, on the right hand of the slide, uh, featuring the different uh, research projects and, and these different reports that, that are, are coming out of, of the work of the observatory. So as you can see, a lot of uh, exciting developments, both in Africa and in Asia Pacific. We are very grateful to uh, Prince Michael for awarding uh, these, this recognition to these two initiatives and of course to all the the donors that have made this possible in the case of the Asia Pacific Observatory, um, the donors are the UK aid, uh, the quality of infrastructure partnership housed by, hosted by the, uh, by the World Bank and the FIA Foundation. I think that's it for this one, Adrian. Absolutely. And um, then the final one, again, focuses on the importance of speed management. And it uses an example, an outstanding example, um, from uh, a, a city of Bogota. Hello, everyone. I'm Natalie Torregrosa, the head of the Road Safety Office at the Mobility Secretariat of Bogota. I want to begin by thanking the Prince Michael International Road Safety Awards for recognizing the work of Bogota in implementing safer speed limits and for allowing us to share our experience developing and implementing our speed management program with all of you. Road traffic injuries in Bogota for many years have been the second cause of violent deaths in the city. For the last decade, the number of fatalities has plateaued between 500 and 600 deaths per year. In 2016, the year before the city started working on the speed management program, there were a total of 585 fatalities. Vulnerable road users accounted for 95% of all fatal victims and 72% of all deaths occurred on arterial roads. In 2017, in response to this data and with the aim of addressing this issue from a comprehensive approach, we adopt Vision Zero as the roadmap for our 10-year road safety plan to reduce the number of road traffic deaths by 35%. One of the main elements of this strategy has been the development and implementation of the speed management program. This is a tool that aims to manage safe speeds in the city through a holistic approach involving engineering, data, education, enforcement, and communication strategies. The program is divided in three levels. The first one, reducing the maximum speed limit from 60 to 50 km per hour. This applies mostly to all the main roads of the city. Then we have residential, commercial and school areas where the speed limit shouldn't exceed the 30 km per hour or 40 km per hour in the case of commercial zone. Now, have we implemented? This has been a gradual strategy that started with data analysis. This phase was critical to identify those roads with the highest rates of road crashes and fatalities, and where the speed records showed that the imposed limits were not being respected. Then we needed to position this issue in the public agenda. In this stage, it was vital to raise awareness of the magnitude of the burden of road crashes in our society, and why we needed to approach this as a public health problem. Through mass media campaign and permanently working with the local media, it has been possible to elevate the profile of speeding as a major risk factor. Education strategy have also been key to re-engineer the road safety discourse and make it easy 
for the citizens to grasp the issue and the message with supporting data. This was followed by change in the infrastructure, in this case, speed limit signals. And last but not least, enforcement. Our work has gradually allowed us to refute the normality of road crashes, deaths, and position that the loss of, of lives in the roads are not acceptable. So, what have been the results of our efforts? We are proud to say that Bogota has gradually transformed into a city that prioritizes people over vehicles, and speed management has been critical to create a mobility system that aims to protect pedestrians, bikers, and drivers alike. The results of two concrete actions for our speed management program leave no doubt about the effectiveness of reducing the maximum speed limit from 60 to 50 kilometers per hour to prevent deaths on the roads. Back in October 2018, we first decided to establish the speed limits of five of the most critical corridors. By the end of 2019, we completed a total of 10 roads with these new speed limits that account for 40% of the deaths of the city. During a period of 14 months, Bogota was able to save 46 lives on these corridors, which represent a reduction of 21% in the number of fatalities when compared to the average of the three previous years. Later, in May 2020, in the middle of the sanitary crisis caused by COVID-19 pandemic, our current major, Claudia Lopez, implemented permanently the 50 km per hour speed limit throughout the city. This decision, which is key to reach this administration goal to reduce the number of fatalities on the roads, initially aimed helping the city to reduce the number of road crashes during the lockdown. During this period, we were registering five deaths per week, despite the dramatic reduction of the mobility. We are very optimistic about the results of the first year of this measure. However, the record from the first seven months show great outcomes. From May 10 to December 31 of 2020, there was a reduction of 25% of the number of deaths on this corridor where the speed limit was reduced when compared to the average between 2017 and 2019. This represents 56 lives saved. What was key to reach these outcomes? As you may know, establishing new speed limits. What in most cases means reducing them can be really controversial. In our case, it has definitely been challenging and we are still in the process of acceptance. Despite challenging, it has been gratifying to see that all efforts led by the Secretariat of Mobility have allowed the city to, to prevent deaths of numerous citizens in our roads. This wouldn't have been possible without the commitment of the people who have been working in the mobility sector, which reflect the leadership and political will of the local authorities to prioritize road safety and speed management, starting with the highest political figures. When the former administration decided to implement the 50 km per hour limit on critical corridors, Bogota became the first city in Colombia to start adopting the maximum speed limit recommended by the WHO and put the discussion around the speed on the top of the public agenda. Later, our current mayor, Claudia Lopez, escalated up this measure citywide, proving her commitment with the protection of the lives on the road and adopting the speed management program as a crucial element of her mobility policy. The efforts of both administrations prioritizing road safety has allowed the citizens to witness how the continuity of a strategy focused on the common good can set aside political difference. I couldn't conclude this presentation without acknowledging the support of the partner organization of the Bloomberg Philanthropy Initiative for Global Road Safety to develop our speed management program. Now, I would like to invite Claudia Diazola from WRI to tell us more about the technical support of this program in establishing safer speed limits. Thank you, Natalie. WRI has been delighted to work with the city of Bogota since 2015. We have been able to work with the city thanks to the Bloomberg 
philanthropist initiative for global road safety. And we have a dome spot in partnership with all these wonderful organizations. The city back in 2015 had one big question. How do we save lives on the streets? And one of the main answers was to look at the street. At that time, the administration of Mayor Peñalosa with the leadership of Secretary of Mobility to Juan Pablo Bocarejo and the director of Road Safety to Claudia Diaz started working on speed management. We look very closely at the data and we realize how incredibly um, oh, there was an overlap between high speed and the number of fatalities and serious injuries. They started acting, they started reducing speeds, and this has been work that has continued under the leadership of Mayor Claudia Lopez and Nicolás Estupiñán. Thanks to that leadership, more than 100 lives have been saved in Bogota. Building capacity at the local level has been crucial. We brought experts, international experts, and we also work with the communities to listen to them and to understand what were their concerns. One of the major concerns was, are we creating more congestion when we are setting safe speed? We did some micro-modeling and we realized that there was no impact. We were saving lives and we were not worsening congestion. All this great work of Volta is now creating ripple effects, not only within other cities in uh, Colombia, also at the national level. Speed is a topic that is now being studied, and this is also part of what the region in Latin America is observing and working on. I just want to thank the city of Volta for all their great work the United Nations Rail Safety Collaboration, and the Prince Michael International Road Safety Award for allowing us to share this experience. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention. Here you can find our contact details. We are really open to any question or doubts uh, regarding our program. So special thanks to the team from Bogota, to the Asia and Pacific and African observatory teams, um, and to all our presenters, because I think two things stand out. The first is the importance of collaboration and cooperation in order to deliver um, high-grade projects. And the second, which features very much as a lead into the launch of this next decade of action, the importance of speed management at the center of any effective program. So I now hand back to Susanna for our next session. Thank you all. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Adrian, and thanks for the team who's helping me uh, handling all this this afternoon. Uh, for those who have joined us uh, a little bit later, my name is Susanna Zamataro. I'm the Director General of the International Road Federation in Geneva. Uh, who is one of the uh, organization coordinating uh, this UNRSC webinar <clears throat> today. Um, I'm looking at my watch because I need to be careful with, uh, with time. Uh, we have just uh, heard from uh, fantastic um, experiences and uh, from uh, some of the uh, Prince Michael awardees uh, around the world. And we had pre-recording them uh, because they, uh, they, they are sitting in different parts of, of the world and, and and so for, the, for making sure that connections and, um, and, and technology would be clear on our side, but also um, uh, difficulty in aligning um, all um, uh, sitting in very different time zones. Now I have the great pleasure of being the moderator of a very quick uh, session now of roughly 15 minutes, because we need to make sure we, we leave also uh, sufficient time for the uh, third uh, panel today. And we're gonna be hearing um, about innovating country uh, delivery. We're gonna look at three different uh, geographies this time. Um, so three different countries, uh, Georgia, uh, Tanzania and uh, Pakistan. 
and I would say three different types of stakeholders action um, and engagement as well. One uh, from uh, with Jella from uh, a, an NGO, a second one with Rachel uh, with a, a charity with, with a, a massive international uh, reach, and the third one with Malia. Um, uh, about uh, experience uh, and action coming from academia and, and research. So three different geographies, uh, three different types of stakeholders, but one common goal, I would say, uh, and that is saving, saving lives uh, for sure. Um, I have the great pleasure to welcome today uh, Jela uh, Washilava. He is the founder of uh, the Partnership for the Road Safety Foundation in Georgia and a member of the board of directors of the Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety. I have the pleasure to welcome Rachel Nangwa. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, Rachel. Um, apologies for that. She's the Africa lead of the International Road Assessment Program, IRAP, uh, and she's talking to us out of Uganda, but we'll be talking about Tanzania in a minute. And Dr. Mahi Mal Malia Nassim, she's instructor, instructor at the Aga Khan University Hospital, Department of Community Health and Science in Pakistan. Welcome, and I'd like to invite all the speakers to um, come to the stage by opening up their, their videos. Uh, I would like to start with uh, Jella. I don't see you in my screen, but I'm sure you, you are there somewhere. Uh, Jella, I, I'd like to, um, to talk with you about um, the experience in innovative ways in which NGOs in your region engage uh, with government um, and, and manage to deliver impact and drive uh, change. And um, specifically, if we can, uh, Jella, with examples, in fact, of the fantastic work you're doing in Georgia. Five minutes, uh, Jella, because uh, you need to keep within Thank time. Thank you very much, Susanna. That, uh, uh, actually, we are uh, very in definitive moment when the sec second decade of action for old safety start. And uh, uh, very important to say that uh, in these next decades, uh, uh, more responsibility will lie on the national government. So I would say that three words are very important, which we it worked uh, in last decade and uh, worked very well. It's uh, integration, accountability, and building local knowledge. Uh, so um, uh, uh, when we started our work in Georgia, it was clear that if you don't integrate road safety other pri uh, uh, with other areas, as an example, urban planning or public transport, then it does not work and it's not priority. So we, we, what you can see from the picture, when there was a renovation and public uh, transport development project in Tbilisi, we pursued local government to put uh, road safety as a, one of the priority to make speeds lower. So, it, and it showed clearly that road safety can bring benefits to other areas. So now it's streets are more livable. Uh, we have, uh, and, and it's uh, less noisy. So it is clearly demonstration how road safety can benefit other uh, areas of our activity and urban life. So the, the most important thing, uh, what we, I, I want to bring from the last decade that uh, how to make national or local government accountable. So uh, our role as the NGOs, it's more vital today because uh, is one of the key recommendation of Stockholm uh, 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 conference that we have to make reporting. We have to oblige government or private comp companies to report on uh, the sustainability, report on road safety. So I think that all on these three areas, uh, we can use new technology. I mean, when we speak about innovation, all these three areas are very well to, to be used. Technology as a tool to make government more accountable. So uh, what we've done uh, really in Georgia uh, for last decade, that uh, we somehow helped government to have capacity uh, to develop tools for new tools for roastery design, develop tools for uh, education. So 
all these tools are uh, now available. So I would say that our experience somehow is working with government, helping them, assisting them to fill this uh, gap of uh, knowledge, because as you know, government officials are elected and after elections they come and go. So who are the owners really of road safety? Of course, we are organizations like civic organizations who are really bringing this uh, knowledge to the next decision makers. We try somehow train, educate them again to be in, uh, to be supporters of to 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 be to to have uh, next transformation. So the role of the NGOs are very important. And in this case, coalition of NGOs in Georgia really trying to bring road safety with other issues on the table of the decision makers. Because as you know, uh, during the COVID, uh, lots of resources are diverted to the to address it. And so I'm sure there is a risk that road safety issue will be uh, somehow neglected. There is a risk of this. So we have to explain that healthy streets, safe streets, it's also <laughs> supports uh, to fight COVID pandemia, so we have to find these connections, and that's that's we are, that's that's the most important thing. Because thanks to WHO international donors, we have very ambitious goals. We have a roadmap, uh, and uh, but the most important thing we have to keep uh, national governments active, keep them in shape. Don't forget road safety, safe mobility issues. So that's why very important uh, to remind that it is road safety is not standalone issue. It's a part of issue which can help address other issues too. So that was our experience, which we are like building. And uh, as Etienne mentioned, we have this knowledge, it's accumulated, but you have to bring it. What we've done, actually, there's a very good NECTO tool, which we have translated and trained local engineers. So now they are really willing to, when they plan or transform streets, to put really shared roads, not roads for the only cars. So they understand also benefits, so it's much easier for them. So to bring this knowledge, connect it with the local engineers, transport planners, connect with uh, other uh, areas, it's key. Thank you so much, uh, Jela, for this uh, testimony um, uh, from, from Georgia. And indeed, uh, the, uh, the recovery and the stimulus packages, investments that will go uh, now in infrastructure going forward to relaunch the economies offer us a great opportunity uh, to, to do things right, to think infrastructure for all road users and not just for cars. Thank you so much, Jela. I'd like now to turn to uh, Rachel, um, IRAP lead um, in, uh, in Africa. Uh, Rachel, you and I this morning have spent quite a bit of time on, online for the national workshop we are running in, in Tanzania for the 10, which is marking as well the launch of the 10 step uh, project. What is really innovative uh, in this project? Why does it make uh, a difference? Rachel. Well, so it's a big question, Susanna, and it's a difficult one. Um, but in essence, um, I, I'm assuming most of you know about the 10 steps project, but just to be very, very brief, uh, it's a UN project and it's being piloted in Tanzania. So it's the first country to actually try this methodology of implementing road safety in a sustainable way. So we're all watching and we're all hoping that it works out so it can be easily replicated in other countries. So it's a very good pilot time for us. Um, so in essence of the biggest part of it is, uh, sorry, the essence of the 10 steps plan is there's four focus areas. And with those, within those focus areas, uh, we're basically supposed to focus on how to integrate road safety, embed it within organizations, develop systems and processes which ensure that there's the how-to questions answered. So everybody knows how to build safer roads and sustainably and continuously improve the existing roads. And also looking at what tools and methods are available and what tools and methods are, can be developed from learning um, to improve road safety in 
in, in the long run. Um, and of course, so that obviously means or leads us to know that training, capacity building, knowledge sharing is very, very key to this plan or to this project and to the sustainability of ensuring road safety is continuously done in projects. Now, 10 steps um, within the four focus areas, there's three priority areas, and that's where the 10 steps are developed. And in essence, those 10 steps are there to support the focus areas that we just that I just talked about very quickly. I've got five minutes, so I have to. Um, I believe there's a website where you can actually go and look up the what the 10 steps are and what the various elements of that are. Um, but for Tanzania to be specific is we have some expected outcomes and some impacts that we're hoping to gain. Uh, all of them are pretty much um, around the subject area of sustainability. Um, we have, we're hoping to develop a, a coordination program, which is the, the, the a national RAP program. So you may have heard about the, the IRAP programs around the world, like Brazil RAP, India RAP, China RAP, and so on. So we're hoping to develop a Tanzania RAP. Um, so it's a coordinated program with all the stakeholders engaged and involved and, com and complementing the, the outcomes and the things that actually are delivered through that project. We're hoping it will be like a coordination stroke steering committee type of situation, but of course, it's a Tanzanian program and a Tanzanian project. So in, at the end of the day, the, the Tanzanian stakeholders will decide how that will run and how it will be managed and, and supported throughout its time. Um, so in, in essence, by developing that, we're hoping to have like a, a coordination kind of role, or co coordination kind of um, activity happening in Tanzania, where all stakeholders are involved in decisions and improving systems. Um, to supplement that, there will be a systematic training and accreditation system. So we're hoping for something like a, a safe road certification scheme. This basically supports things like professionalism in road safety, ensuring that people who are giving advice about building safer roads are qualified and professional in the, in the manner that they're doing it. Um, and also it's about the skills development, knowing who has done road safety training, knowing who's an IRAP accredited um, provider and so on. And we're looking at how to impact actual projects on the ground. So not necessarily just talking about safety and how it can be improved, but actually improving the roads that are actually being built and safety being a very key consideration in the de determination of which projects get funded and which projects get built. So having that as the deciding factor on where the money goes is very, very important. That leads us to, to achieving the, three, the uh, target three and target four of the UN um, World Safety Infrastructure Targets, which is in essence say that um, all new roads as well as existing roads should be 75% uh, of existing roads should at least meet a three star minimum. So be three star, four star or five star rating by 2030. So within the next decade. Um, what makes this particularly unique is, I'm not sure if it's that unique, but it's, it's, it's an interesting way of, do, of doing projects in Tanzania, is it's not, it's not going to be experts coming in and telling Tanzanians how to do these things. We're hoping that it will be led by the local experts, so it'll be 100% Tanzanian owned, it will be led by Tanzanians, managed by Tanzanians, and the, the, the development of the project will work because of the, the needs from the stakeholders in Tanzania. So we're not, people are not gonna walk in there and tell them what's right, but they're gonna to listen to the issues and understand the gaps and actually try to complement what's already present and improve on that. Um, we hope to develop a center of excellence, um, which will basically lead on research and development of anything road safety related. Um, and we hope to actually engage with other, other uh, funders and development partners who are also looking at developing a, a center of excellence in Africa to see if we can actually do that as a, as a partnership and a collaboration, but with a big emphasis on the local input. Of course, training and capacity building is key. Um, it, without knowledge and without uh, understanding and, and sharing and teaching and continual learning, this program will probably not survive for very long. So it's about focusing on actually education um, setting up systems that are actually self-sustaining or whether the local experts who develop through the program will continuously improve and continuously develop these programs and these tools to support the work that they're doing. So it's about developing a Tanzanian program that's fully, that has expertise within the country to support not only Tanzania, but the region, 
but also to establish governance programs and, 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 and um, organizational management systems um, to have this Tanzania RAP program to coordinate all of that, to um, encourage lots of stakeholders to be involved and to basically, we will be looking at um, considering how we can embed road safety learning within the learning institution. So having a, a module in the BN of civil engineering. So it can be embedded within all the engineers that are coming out of the learning system. And we hope to do all that as well as standards, guidelines, and again, not by ourselves, not with experts coming in, but experts imparting their knowledge and supporting the local agencies to develop their own capacity. Thank you Thank very you. much. Rachel, I, I have, um, I'm under the pressure of the clock here. Uh, thank you so much for this comprehensive overview of, uh, of the 10 step project. You will hear from uh, IRF, IRAP and VIARC and, and TAR about this because we are the project uh, partners uh, delivering this project and supporting Tanzania. And, and so stay tuned, information is on all our websites um, already available and, and more to come soon. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'd like to invite now Malia to, uh, from Pakistan to open up her video and to the team uh, to move uh, slides forward. Malia, can you hear us well? Are you with us? Yes, thank you, Susanna. Hello, everyone. Fantastic. And greetings from Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, thank you again, Susanna, for the, uh, for the opportunity. And I welcome the colleagues across the board in this webinar. So I'll briefly talk about some of the background of our work and some of the innovation strategies that we have followed in the past decade of action that has been very gratefully followed by our, some of a few researchers in the country. And some of the, so I'll talk about a few steps forward as well regarding innovation. So Pakistan is a low middle income country and we have a very weak trauma care provision infrastructure. The, the, there's no specific emergency medical system integration process and all our EMS systems within the country operate separately and they operate in different provinces actually. So the integration is, is the biggest problem that we face right now, especially the integration of trauma systems and the integration of trauma systems with the EMS systems. And that is the biggest challenge that we have been facing since the last decade. However, so having said that, we have been able to generate some of good research projects, some of the evidence related to injuries and their outcomes, but still there's a whole way loads to go forward. So what we ha have done uh, in the past that uh, we try to crash because we don't have data sets available that capture related uh, information related to injuries, pre-event and post uh, crash care. So for that, in order to get some information regarding the post rash outcomes, what we did, we developed a prospective cohort study, we designed that, and we did a data collection in four major, three to three major tertiary care hospitals in the city of Karachi. So Karachi itself is a highly populated city, and it, the traffic situation over here is, is, is really, really bad. There are no, the, the traffic laws are not implemented and we see a lot of road traffic crashes, including adults and children on daily basis. So there's a lot of gap in the policy and implementation level as well. So to, in order to generate that kind of evidence, we planned this prospective cohort study. We did a, followed a cohort of patients in these hospitals and this data collection we did for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, continuously for four months in these hospitals and um, we collected information on every important variable like the time of crash, the location of crash, the time to reach to hospital, which is a major challenge in, in, our, in, our, in, in our city and in, especially in our country because we don't have any specific in EMS system in the, in, the, in the city and the country. And the post-crash injury severe Verity calculation is again a major gap that we are, you know, put to get that kind of data. It's very difficult. So in order to gauge all these important information and data related variables, we had to do a thorough, thorough and a very concrete study. And I had to design a very thorough, strong questionnaire that captured all this important information. Uh, luckily, I was uh, able to achieve a lot more data uh, in for the study, but uh, we had to stop in the middle after a few months because we were lack of funding support. 
So the study was funded by NIH per se, but due to the, the time lag and then due to lack of some uh, funding resources, we were unable to you know, scale up this project forward to uh, include more variables, to include more patient outcomes in the study project. We also aimed to incorporate like a um, few more innovation strat strategies. We, will, we aim to incorporate uh, analysis strategies, larger data set. We aim to develop a larger data set uh, related to injuries uh, by scaling up our project. But unfortunately, as I, I've mentioned, that we don't have that much funding uh, available and we are trying our best that we will be able to incorporate these kind of things and secure more funding in the coming time, especially with the with the extension of the decade, decade of action. Uh, this is an important agenda that we'd be following in the coming time. So I would still say that data collection in, in the country is a major challenge, but that can be overcome with some of the funding as well as innovation strategies. We have a center of excellence in trauma and emergencies place in the in the in the hospital, and that uh, it's 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 in the in the starting phase, and we are trying our best to you know collaborate with the with the state with the the, the policymakers to work more on road safety related projects to 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 improve the outcomes of the patients and the road traffic crash victims, and we are also engaging with the policymakers uh, so that we have uh, a better implementation of road traffic safety laws. We have better roads. We have better integrated trauma care systems uh, within the country, and uh, the way we have a lot more to come, and we have a long way forward to work on, and we are trying our best to do so. So let's see what what uh, future holds with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maria, for this uh, um, for this testimony from from Pakistan. And UNRSC is also about that, right? It's it's about connecting. Uh, different stakeholders, different uh, initiatives. That's also one of the reasons uh, why we are hosting all these webinars to make sure that expertise and knowledge is shared, but we create those partnerships and connections that will allow us uh, to, uh, to deliver. If I would uh, were to summarize this session with one word and for the, for the extraordinary work that all of you are doing in your country, probably the word that comes to my mind is perseverance. Uh, we need to keep um, keep uh, pushing and, and assisting as well, supporting. It, it's not just confronting uh, authorities, but really working hand in hand. Here, it's not about telling a government or somebody else uh, what to do or how to do it, but making all together meaningful uh, decisions that will save uh, millions of lives. Thank you so much to all the speakers of this uh, panel. I'm literally running and passing the floor now to my colleague, Mark Shorten. Um, advisory board member of the Road Safe UK and from a former program manager of the Global Road Safety Facility at the World Bank for the next session. Mark, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. Uh, welcome to my panel and welcome to this last session on innovative resource delivery for the new decade of action. Uh, let me briefly introduce the panelists. Uh, Hart Schaefer, is the Vice President for South Asia for the World Bank, one of the largest and most important regions for road safety in the bank. And he has had an extensive career at the Vice Presidential level and the Country Director level in the bank. Matthew Baldwin is Deputy Director of DG Move and the European Coordinator for Road Safety and Sustainable Mobility. He is also current Chair of the United Nations Road Safety Fund Trust Fund Advisory Board. Kelly Larson is director of Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, and he, she directs the road safety programs, the drowning prevention and partnership for healthy cities programs and brings more than 30 years experience managing local, national and international health programs. And last, Darren Lindsay is the former head of government and public affairs in Africa and the Middle East for Michelin, one of the world's largest tire manufacturers and over the last decade, he has helped Michelin build their reputation in the private sector as a world leader in safe mobility. Welcome to all, and we we'll see you on the screen in a moment. Thanks. 
Let's start with Hart. Hart, you actually led the uh, World Bank delegation in 2009 to the first global ministerial meeting. As you saw, today's webinar is focused on speakers' success stories across the world who are facing specific challenges in the implementation of road safety. But for your particular region in the bank, are there specific efforts going on at the ground level that stand out in your mind for their innovation? Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Congratulations to the winners of the Prince Michael Award. And uh, for us in South Asia, road safety is a development issue. Uh, two numbers are, are standing out. One is 10% of the motor vehicle fleet is in South Asia, but 25% of the road crashes happen in South Asia. So this is not only um, a huge impact and toll on the health situation, on the human capital situation, but also it's an economic issue. And uh, that's why in the World Bank, we have integrated road safety in our dialogue, in our analytics, and in our operations. Uh, we are seeing actually some considerable progress. Uh, we are seeing uh, that road safety has become an issue that is embraced in a holistic way. It is no longer just thought of as the Minister of Transport's problem, but we see that um, the Minister of the Interior for Governance, Enforcement, Education, Health, they are all sitting around the table and they are thinking, how can we make sure that a young, uh, most productive life is not lost after we have put that life through school and university? That would be, that is, that is a tragedy that happens. And I think this is where, uh, where we are coming in from the World Bank working with governments, and there are signs of, of success. One is last month we had in India, the road safety month. And I was in two events virtually, of course, with Minister Gatkari. Uh, one was to launch a report and uh, support the new Motor Vehicle Act, which is path breaking, and will make sure that standards are observed, will make sure that speed limits are enforced and so on. The other one was to go to one of the states, Tamil Nadu, which has succeeded in the last three years to bring down road death by 25%. They have been doing that because they brought all the stakeholders around the table. It was a holistic approach and we need to replicate these more in other states, but also across the region. Thanks, Art. The Tamil Nadu story is absolutely one of the early great success wins in this new decade and holistic approach, Matthew. You know, for the average road safety practitioner in a developing country, or perhaps even an agency official, the complexity of the safe system, road safety paradigm may seem perhaps overwhelming. Now, if you were advising somebody in a country how to explain to their officials what the safe system is in 60 seconds, what would you say? 60 seconds, well, uh, thanks, thanks everyone. Great to be with you. What a wonderful webinar, fantastic presentations and brilliantly kept on time by Susanna. Um, look, um, we make everything far too complicated uh, than we need to. It isn't that complicated. The safe system is a gloriously simple, if revolutionary concept, because basically, Mark, what it's saying is that death and serious injuries are not an inevitable consequence of our mobility. They are largely preventable events. So essentially, we are looking for a more forgiving road system. We accept that we're human beings, we're going to make mistakes, but only on the roads are these fatal or causing serious injuries. So we need this layered combination of measures to prevent people dying from being human, uh, if I could put it that way, taking the physics of human vulnerability into account. I'll spare your audience the list of things, but it's about vehicles and infrastructure and safe speeds, including 30 would be great. Um, and as we develop this uh, new global report, uh, sorry, the new global plan of action to implement uh, the, the fantastic new targets we have, we need to find workable, clear solutions for the short and the long term for the global north and the global south. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Kelly, you know, one of my favorite memories with you is working between Christmas and New Year uh, some years ago to get the first Bloomberg grant into the World Bank for Road Safety. And as you saw the projects highlighted in the webinar earlier today show that despite perhaps limited resources overall in road safety, action can lead to strong intermediate outcomes and actually, uh, in fact, save lives. 
Do you believe, however, that the road safety community overall is better placed after the first decade to show that it can turn financial resources into reduction in death and injury? Thanks, Mark, and thanks to the panelists. Matthew, I've, I've always wanted a 60 second response for the safe system approach, so thanks for that. Um, so Mark, thanks for the question. I think, you know, looking back to at least when Bloomberg Philanthropies first started in road safety in 2007, there was very, there were very few organizations locally and even internationally that were working in countries around the world. And if you think about the progress we've made in the last 14 years, um, just in building capacity and the ability of organizations to really push and advocate for road safety, we've come a long way. When it comes to lessons learned from um, the last decade of action, I think ATN said that we need to use what we know, transform it and make it stronger. And really it's up to us to capitalize on the um, lessons from the last decade of action. I will say that um, we need more resources to really make that the impact that we want to, to achieve. Um, but it's not from funders like Bloomberg Philanthropies. We need resources from governments to make that commitment to really address road safety and, and for all of us to think about how we can achieve that. And I would just urge uh, all of the organizations out, out there to really garner political will. And we heard the example of Bogota where we had strong a strong political champion in uh, Claudia Lopez, the mayor, and what they've been able to achieve. So really trying to innovate in, in that garnering of political will and capitalizing on lessons from the last decade. Thanks, Kelly. Darren, you know, tapping your broad experience and partnerships with regard to resources in particular, following COVID, do you anticipate a private sector retraction from engaging on social issues like road safety, or do you see scope for the opposite? Um, firstly, thanks, Mark, for, for this opportunity to, to obviously represent the private sector here today on this panel. Um, the, the question you share with me here has come up a, a few times um, recently, obviously, because of the current uh, conditions. But uh, my, my answer to you would be along the lines of it really does depend on the values um, of the company we're talking about here or companies um, and their maturity in terms of where they act. Um, in, in terms of an organization financially. And, and one of the things I would share with you at the moment, if you just listen out, there's a number of things being discussed at the moment, in particular ESGs, which is the environment, social and governance side by companies. And they're very good at doing this at the moment um, during these more challenging times. Why? Because it impacts their public image. Um, they see this as being an opportunity to actually reach out to the public to try and better their image and of course their value at the same time. So if I look at it from this point of view, I would say that it really does present opportunities to companies at the moment. And to the audience listening here, I would say to them, look at the organizations who are good at doing this and you will probably find them as being the potential partners out there who could help champion your courses going forward, both financially and from a resource point of view. The other thing I would mention here as well, you hear them talk about the subject net zero. And I've obviously heard this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are, vision zero in particular, Bogota was talking. So I kind of talk in a similar language here, but some people use it in reference to environment. Others use it in reference to mobility. So there really does exist there to me, this opportunity to sort of grasp that, to enhance and amplify that message. But the other thing I think we need to do from a private sector's point of view, and for those of you that may not be aware of the good work that's going on in the background, I like to say we really do have some big guns ready to fire when it comes to creating a movement about safer mobility. And some of the work being undertaken at the moment by the FIA in particular, it's trying to create a new movement. And, and what's different about it this time is how can you engage with the private sector to get their attention to invest not just in time, but in terms of resources and finance as well. So I'm quite excited in terms of what's coming around the corner here. I think now is the time. Now is certainly the time to engage on this topic. But just as my final takeaway to this question here, let's see this as being an opportunity um, for private sector. 
let's not waste this opportunity to engage with the public and the private sector here to obviously raise the importance of safer mobility. Thanks very much, Darren. Uh, Kelly, I hear you loud and clear on terms of uh, government resources needing to be exponentially opened up in order to make impact on the ground. But nevertheless, Bloomberg is a leader uh, in the global road safety fight. So as a major donor, when you are looking for recipients that you believe can be innovative, how are you looking for them to be innovative when you select them for grants? So, you know, I would argue that we're, we, we don't necessarily look at innovation. We look at technical expertise and really organizations that are nimble and flexible and can utilize their strengths and skills, whether it be on police enforcement, communications, infrastructure, urban planning, advocacy. I think that when we, when we think about that, probably one of the most important aspects is garnering that political will how innovative can organizations be around their strategies? Can, you know, using the media to, to highlight the, the importance of road safety and, and to promote leaders, to encourage them to be even stronger. Um, thinking about capacity building and networking. How can, how can organizations bring different leaders together, different technical experts together so that we can share lessons learned and expand already the good work. For example, in Bogota, we're working really hard to expand that reduction of speeds citywide to other cities in Colombia and hopefully regionally. So um, really looking to organizations that ha have that ability to bring people together to share lessons learned and to really advocate um, for stronger legislation, stronger interventions, uh, but when it comes to the, at least the, the partners that we've selected, we, we select based on technical expertise. Thank you. Hart, in terms of um, the World Bank uh, and the development banks at large and partnerships, the development banks are understood, of course, to work with governments. But if you're the average road safety practitioner, perhaps listening to this, uh, this discussion, development banks really still are not that well understood by the road safety community at large. What are some ways non-governmental stakeholders can get involved in working with or perhaps alongside MDBs in your area? Mark, uh, this is a great question because earlier I said, it takes a holistic approach on the government side. The different ministries need to come together. Same thing is true for us who are supporting the governments to come together. And the World Bank is, is working, of course, with the other MDBs, the Asian Development Bank in particular, in my case, but the UN family, uh, the FIA, FIA Foundation, academia, civil society, and the private sector was very pleased to hear the role of the private sector can actually be scaled up. Let me give you a couple of examples. Civil society is something in South Asia where we are partnering with PRAC in Bangladesh, with the Safe Life Foundation in India. Um, we just had a, a joint analytics done that really points at what is needed uh, to help crash victims, compensation, insurance, the rights of crash victims, because very often it wipes out the livelihood of an entire family. Academia, we are working with the India Institute of Technology on a crash database. Data is so important and the centers of excellence need to be established in academia. They have, and we heard from academia in an in, in earlier session. The UN family, of course, uh, we, we are partnering across the board, but in road safety, it's particularly important. And I would like to highlight the role of two things. One is the UN uh, Road Safety Trust Fund, and the other one is the special envoy for, for road safety of the uh, UN Secretary General. Uh, we have been doing things together, um, approaching for advocacy, for looking for solutions. And I think this, these partnerships are very critical because the World Bank, we cannot do it alone. Nobody can do it alone. Thank you, Hart. Matthew, um, Hart mentioned the UN Road Safety Trust Fund, uh, which we mentioned earlier, you are chair of the advisory group. You know, on the idea of getting these major funds to partnerships, uh, to get into partnerships and get money to partners. And with the topic of our uh, uh, panel today, what innovation could be developed in the methodology for resource allocation of a global fund like the UN fund what do you see is needed in order to get that result on the ground? Well, a bit like Kelly, I'm maybe I'm a Luddite or I'm an analog person, but I slightly, I slightly tear up the word uh, innovation. I mean, I think uh, the new kid on the block, which is the UN Road Safety Fund, needs first to 
watch and learn and look and listen at, and see what the other big funds have done. And it's great to be on a panel with the World Bank and with you, Mark, for everything you've done, and of course, with Kelly, because you've really been the the, the path breakers and, and we've got a lot to learn. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, the UN Road Safety Fund has the chance to play a key role because of the the because of what it says on the tin, it's the UN, and we're bigged up in the uh, in the resolution of the UN General Assembly, which is very welcome. But we recognise we're new and we're quite small and we're quite poor, and we'd like to change that. So if anyone would like to give us some money out there, that would be very welcome. I think it's also important to use this fund as a way of plugging mainstreaming, to use a, a, a familiar word, road safety across the UN system. And I think the fund's done very well there. But we also need to partner. We need to partner well with the World Bank uh, facility. And I think we haven't done that enough in the past. And we'd like to do more of that. We'd like to learn from Bloomberg and the FIA Foundation and the great things they've been done. And again, I don't think it's rocket science. We need to communicate effectively we need to raise money efficiently and we need to do great projects that make a difference. And that's what we're trying to focus on doing. And uh, it's a great, uh, great experience for me, this. Thank you, Matthew. Yes, certainly that leveraging model that's been used in the past by funds like the facility and elsewhere has, has done a great um, for uh, putting resources at scale up at the ground level. But Kelly, uh, you mentioned recently at the transforming transportation event at the World Bank that one of the major lessons learned for you and the team at Bloomberg was that the public health sector was not going to be able to solve this issue alone and that the transport sector uh, had to play a key fundamental role. Do you think we are seeing enough cooperation between these two sectors at the ground level in order to innovate and free up delivery of resources? Um, you know, thank you for the question, Mark, and that would be a big no. Um, I think that we have a long ways to go and just reinforce Hart's comments, just needing stronger partnership and cross-sectoral collaboration of ministries and government agencies at the subnational level to really strengthen the inputs and the outcomes of, of our efforts. Um, but I think that we've come a long way. And, you know, ironically, um, even though with COVID, when we haven't been able to be traveling in person, we've still been able to engage with different ministries and also with, you know, all of us and being able to share lessons learned and take from one another. So I think that we have a long ways to go. It takes a lot of effort, but it's well worth um, the, the time and energy to make sure that there is that cross-sectoral um, communication with police, with transport, with urban planning, with the leadership, whether it be you know ministers or mayors. So um, that's something that we at Bloomberg Philanthropies really prioritize because if you don't have that cross-sectoral collaboration um, at the government level, you're not gonna achieve the outcomes you're hoping for. Thank you. Yes, we have come a long way since the early parts of the last decade. Part on the issue of innovating resource delivery to the regional and global road safety community. What new opportunities do you see in the new decade? Two things, data and finance. Um, data management, we heard earlier about the, the road safety observatories and so on. I hope that we are going to uh, replicate what happened in, 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 uh, in the LAC region, the Latin America region in South Asia. So because we, we cannot make policy decisions without having evidence-based uh, analytics and, um, and and data. The second one, and that is funding and financing. And I think earlier we heard from uh, the panel that the private sector needs to be engaged more. In South Asia, the needs are enormous, over $100 billion. This cannot only come from MDBs, from the World Bank or others. We need to bring in the private sector. And we have been looking at replicating the experience that we had 10, 15 years ago in the early ages of the green bonds, um, the blue bonds, and why can't we have a safe life bond where we are bringing in private finance. It's good for the bottom line, but it's also good social impact and social responsibility. And this is an, this is an idea that we are developing right now. Uh, we hope that we can actually bring this uh, um, proof of concept uh, into, into India, into our program. But the idea is to tap into the private sector to actually strengthen road safety um, in, uh, along the whole way in terms of making roads safer, safer, making sure that uh, standards are observed and so on. So data and finance, those are the two new innovations that we need. 
Thank you, Hart. Matthew, uh, you know, talking about an issue that is on everybody's minds lately, you mentioned in a previous United Nations road safety collaboration meeting that equity issues in road safety, particularly solutions derived from Western models may not be cutting it in the new UN decade of action for road safety. Can you talk a little bit about what you meant and what you proposed perhaps under this new paradigm? Mm. A new paradigm is a grand word for what I was probably talking about in the, in the UN Road Safety Corporation meeting. Um, but thanks for the invitation and very interested to hear what Hart just said about saving live bonds. What a great idea. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, no, I think um, this is all part of what Darren referred to earlier about getting road safety out of its little corner where we've been sitting quietly for too long. Uh, he mentioned the environment uh, and sustainability issues as a, as a classic partner issue, and that's right. And I think I think equity is another one. I mean, it's it's quite sharp politically, but we've got to think about it. In any town, north or south, where is it, where are the good pavements or sidewalks in American English um, for pedestrians? They're in the rich parts of town. That's where everyone has the cars. In two thirds of city, uh, two thirds of the um, uh, poorer neighborhoods of Berlin. Uh, sorry, two thirds of the households in poorer neighborhoods of Berlin do not have access to a car. Half of the citizens of Brussels don't have access to a car. Gender equity issues, we're just uh, less than a week past the International Women's Day. And I noted then that women are disproportionately much more likely to be killed than men when they're out walking. And who's out walking? In, in, uh, it, it's women, particularly in the global south. We've got to think about these different angles on our issues and not just to take statistics dryly as they come at us off a page, or we're not gonna make a difference and we're not gonna get political attention. Thanks, Matthew. In, Darren, uh, private sector participation in global road safety, um, as we talked about earlier, has taken on various forms over the last decade, but the call for more of it, as you heard today, is out there and it's constant from the road safety community. In 2021, what do you see as a type of effective private sector partnerships that are happening on the ground with governments and UN road safety collaboration members? I think really to kind of follow on from what's been said by the other panel members to this question, is it really a call for more or are we addressing, what I mean by this is that we need more companies to wake up and engage on this, this subject. It seems to be the same companies who are around this table of debate. Um, and if we're going to make a change somehow, we have to think differently and behave differently to engage with others. Um, I know why in the past Michelin were there because we are, let's say, we are very close to the issue. Um, bearing in mind that tires are in contact with the roads. So the element of safety for us is, is paramount. But how do you engage other organizations to wake up to this topic as well? But I also want to name and shame a little bit here as well, because I can. Um, I don't carry that banner anymore for, for the company. But uh, there's still, for me, a few missing industries around this table of debate. And I would say the telecommunications companies, where are they? You know, The car manufacturers in particular as well, they make a safe vehicle and leave it there. The nut is not behind the wheel to them. Um, but then there's also some of the tech startups. If you want to catch these organizations early, is get them at this point of inception when they're starting. And don't get me wrong, there's some very good organizations which are using that as their USP to enter markets and engage with cities, certainly smart cities. So that alone, I think, is, is an area that we can sort of work upon. But in, in terms of the partnerships and collaboration, I think we as a collective here need to identify those organizations that embrace these values so that we can make progress quicker. I also want to touch upon as well the UN Road Safety Fund. To me, that is what I call this multi-sectorial approach. And the brand itself, the UN is massive, you know. It's the private sector, that's what lit us up as an organization to want to engage. It's how many opportunities do you get as a private sector to engage with the UN? So I just encourage anybody out there is, is how do we leverage this, this equity in the brand of the UN to try and sort of enhance what's required out there on the streets to have a positive impact. Let so just, that's kind of where I would come from with this question here at the moment, Mark. Let me just very briefly follow up on that in terms of, you know, again, for the average practitioner looking out there, if they're looking for a specific missing ingredient, ingredient between their organization and linking with the private sector. Okay, right. It's, it, was, it was quite a while back, but many of you may have been in Stockholm or heard some of the presentations there. But something 
stuck very clearly there to me. And thankfully, it was my previous CEO that mentioned this point. And, and he made it very clear um, in Stockholm about the declaration there. And he said, the one element that's missing at the moment still, which we need to build upon, is trust. And that is the trust between the private and the public sector. Um, this will be critical to success. He also added as well is that, do you know, the role that we can play here is, is bring the technical challenges to the private sector, you know, and with your expertise and knowledge, we have the resource and the support available to try and solve some of these issues. So that, that is where we need to sort of kind of use each other here in, in this relationship going forward. But I would also say as well, there's a lot of NGOs operating out there and meaning good um, and often firing some shots into organizations who rightfully deserve those shots, may I add. Um, but at the same time, they need to, or we all need to understand is how can we work effectively with one another? And, and let me give you an example. And this is something I've just been following recently. Um, some of you might know David Davis out there from PAX, an organization based in London. They, they, they wrote quite a condemning report about uh, micromobility and they put it out there and it did impact a lot of companies certainly some of the newer startups and that who could have acted one of two ways they could have turned a blind eye to it and said doesn't doesn't uh, appeal to me or whatsoever and march on or they could have embraced that report and i was pleased to see that one or two have and this takes me back to the point about what some organizations do when they start they embrace the subject here of safe mobility right from the off to try and engage with cities to make it a safer place. And if you want to look up an example here, look up an organization in Europe that started up called TIER. It's one of the micromobility uh, scooter companies at the moment. They've done exactly that. They took David Davis and his organization to his word, went back to him and said, look, tell us more. How do we improve what we are doing out there? We're listening. And I think you now find that David Davis and the organization there are sitting on the technical board of tier as an advisor to help them do business better. So it's, it's just one example of how we can sort of go about this approach differently with one another, see it as an opportunity, listen, reach out and try and work with one another. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Darren. Trust. Trust. Uh, I'd like to wrap up the panel by giving 20 seconds to 30 seconds to each of our uh, panelists to last question. Was there a personal moment of reflection in the last decade or previous or even the last couple of years where you felt that you were seeing road safety innovation literally happening before your eyes? Hart? One moment that I remember is when we had the annual meetings of the World Bank and the IMF in uh, 2018. Normally with ministers of finance, those are our partners, we talk fiscal deficits, uh, economics, and so on. I had a one pager that showed them how much their economies were losing because of road safety issues. Um, that meeting changed totally direction in terms of uh, ministers of finance embracing this as an economics issue. And you get through to them, you get through to the cabinet. Fantastic. Kelly? Just use five seconds trying to unmute. I would say the, the power of political champions. Uh, it takes time, energy, and effort, but with that, those champions, you can get almost anything done. Absolutely. Matthew? Well, mine is a bit prosaic compared to those beautiful ones. There's a fish shop at the bottom of my street, which is a very good fish shop, and it's a big line of people that comes out of it and uh, always waiting to buy their fish. And during the COVID crisis, people realized that the pedestrians didn't have room to get past them. So they took away a parking space on the street so that the people could line up. COVID has made us all think about small innovations. I, I told you I was an analog person. There's an analog innovation. Um, COVID has, has taught us that with, with, there are small innovations that can make huge differences, seismic differences the way we live and run our cities. Thank you. Darren, last word to you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Well, simply for me, I would say new innovation is destructive technology. Um, nobody likes change, but it's there and it's whether or not we choose to embrace it. It has the potential to turn your business upside down, but at the same time, it, it adds many, many opportunities. And the one emergence I've seen, certainly in the past five years, has been big data and digital. 
um, more and more now we see applications that bring the control of mobility into the hands of the user. Um, the challenge going ahead is, is what do we do with that? We've given them quite a lethal weapon, um, but from this point on, how do we all engage to make sure that the streets and cities are safer? Art, Kelly, Matthew, Darren, thank you very much for your wonderful participation. I'd like to turn the panel over or the webinar over to Bill Halkius. He is the new president of IRF Geneva. Bill? So thank you, Mark. Uh, and allow me in this closing to thank you, Andrian Walls, Susanna, and everybody who helped in coordinating and organizing this event. If that was a physical meeting, rest assured we will have a standing ovation. People li literally cheering on the uh, panelists and the presenters. And I do thank you dearly for that. We have heard it in this final panel. Investments and access to adequate financing is so critical issue. The business case for safer road is a very compelling one because we all know, and especially in the low and middle income uh, countries, that for every dollar invested in safer roads, the return on investment is about $11. So investing in safer roads, it makes good chance. The sector has proven that it has the tools to design and build safer roads, but this must be more widely implemented. Road design, the appropriate choice of materials and supplies, the maintenance scenarios, they all play a decisive role in doing what? In saving lives. It is essential that when we plan, design, and deliver infrastructure, we do so with the safety of all users and especially the vulnerable ones as its core and not as an extra gadget that technology or PR necessitates for that. In that respect, recovery and massive investments that it will entail provide a clear opportunity. We need to seize this opportunity and structure stimulus for long-term transformative outcomes. We can only do so by working truly in partnership, public and private, industry and civil society. And we need to create the conditions to do so. Etienne Crook mentioned it at the beginning of this webinar. Work is ongoing on the new plan for the decade of action 2021-2030. And many of the people presenting and attending today this event are part of that collective effort. While we're restating the central role of the safe system approach, that plan will need to really bring forward the idea of the shared responsibility. Because road safety is not just the responsibility of governments. We are all responsible and we can all contribute. On this note, I'm happy to report that the International Road Federation is supporting the Total Foundation in building private sector road safety coalitions in several countries around the world. This morning, the Tanzania Road Safety Coalition has been launched in the presence of the Tanzanian Minister of Works and Transport by six private sector companies operating in that country. The aim is to federate private sector stakeholders to work together in close collaboration with international institutions, NGOs, and local authorities in order to improve road safety via hands-on, impact-oriented, and scalable activities. And as such, the coalition is open to Oh, it's open to other companies who wish to support this collective endeavor. Innovation ought to be of not to be a complicated affair. Innovation can be as simple as making the first fundamental step. With this, I now close this webinar. Please rest reassured, all of you will be notified when recording and presentations will be ready. Don't call us, don't send emails, just go uh, to the IRF website and you will find all the information about this wonderful webinar there. Thank you and goodbye everybody.